Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Uh, well, before we get started, I want to encourage you, if you enjoy great uh, audio entertainment... Uh, be sure and check out our uh, audio books, uh, Tales of the Dim Night and uh, Fly Another Day. Uh, they're great superhero comedies. If you enjoy classic superhero stories, you'll enjoy them. And Scott Wilcox does a great job at bringing all the various characters to life. Uh, they are both available for download either in the iTunes store uh, or uh, through audible.com. And that's Tales of the Dim Night and Fly Another Day. Well, now we embark on a new series. This one's going to be a short-run program, so if you uh, like it, we have a grand total of three weeks. If you don't like it, we're only going to be running it for three weeks. The program premiered uh, in uh, May of 1950. This first episode we have is from May the 7th of 1950, and the episode series would go off the air five months later. The program stars Henry Calvin. Calvin is best known for playing the role of Sergeant Garcia on the 1950s Disney Zorro program. And he had a few other uh, guest appearances in other programs, uh, including uh, my favorite one that I've seen of him was one where he appeared on the Dick Van Dyke show in an episode called The Sam Pomerant Scandals. And uh, Calvin, who is uh, quite fittingly for this role fairly large, uh, impersonated uh, Oliver Hardy with uh, Dick Van Dyke doing Stan Laurel. The program itself is a very interesting concept, partially because it features a uh, detective who's also a father. Now, certainly this wasn't unheard of, but it was pretty rare. You know, of course, there was uh, Charlie Chan and his somewhat uh, extraordinary group of children. But uh, this program, I think, is um, a little bit different and maybe a little bit closer to uh, the reality of a uh, um, dedicated father as a private detective and a widower. Well, that said, let's go ahead and... uh, Uh, Listen to and enjoy this episode. Here now is the big guy, the unheard voice. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) And how tall are you, Papa? Tell us how tall. I'm 20 foot 5 in my stocking feet. How big are your shoes? What size do you wear? Size 902 and a triple Z. That's our Papa, the big guy. (laughs) (laughs) NBC presents The Big Guy, the first in a new series of adventures of a very unusual detective, Joshua Sharp. Joshua Sharp works for his clients on a strictly cash basis to provide for the needs of his nearest and dearest. His nearest and dearest are two in number, Josh Jr. and his daughter Debbie. To these two, Sharp is both father and mother. To his clients, he is a good detective. To Josh and Debbie, he's the friendly magician, the fabulous hero, the giant among giants, the big guy. Tonight's adventure with the big guy, the unheard voice. People who think that children don't fall in love just don't know children. I know mine, and I've seen it. They fall, and they fall hard with all their hearts and souls. 
And if by any chance the romance goes wrong, the bottom falls out of their world. A dream collapses, and the mark is left that may last forever. My kids, Debbie and Josh, fell in love with little Mr. Dooley on sight. Of course, he had his charms. He took tickets at the carousel in the park, and naturally he was the logic logical object of love for everyone in the neighborhood under the age of ten. Saturday was Dooley Day, and for weeks and weeks, nothing had been able to distract my two from paying a call on the wrinkled-faced gnome of a man in his red checkered shirt and his baggy corduroy pants. I'd take them to the park and across the lawns, but no sooner were they in sight of their idol than they'd break loose from me and make a run for... Mr. Dooley! Mr. Dooley! Mr. Dooley! Mr. Dooley! How are you, Mr. Dooley? Well, I, well, yeah, I'm fine as a fiddlestring and fit as a fiddlestick. And ready to play you, too. <laughs> Isn't it a pretty day, Mr. Dooley? Nearly as pretty as you are. <laughs> Fine as silk and sweet as nut, and enough to make a man dance into the jig. Oh, look at Mr. Dooley. He's dancing. He's dancing. He danced very nice, Mr. Oh, Dooley. I can dance a lot nicer, except that I got a bone in my foot. What? Papa? Papa, Mr. Dooley's got a bone in his foot. Oh, that's nothing to worry about. Everybody has a bone in his foot. It's a joke, Josh. A joke? Oh, <laughs> Sure. A bone in your foot. It's only a joke, Daddy. Oh. Everybody ready for the next ride? And your dimes ready? Let's go, Debbie. I'll help you up. Ah, there we are. I got up by myself. Here's a dime for you, Mr. Dooley. Oh, that dime ain't for me. It's for the horses. They gotta eat, you know. Eat? Why, they don't have to eat. They're a ward. Oh, Mr. Dooley's only kidding, ain't you, Mr. Dooley? Kidding, indeed. Why, if you were wood, you, you'd find a nice handful of fresh sawdust tasted pretty good after a fast day of running around in circles. <laughs> now, here we go. Everybody hold tight. Then, one Saturday morning, tragedy struck. It was on page two, and the lead told the story. Bond Avenue mansion robbed, home of broker Jacob Jansen, looted in his absence by a masked burglar. Butler held at gunpoint. City detective Walsh Reynolds arrests former Jansen employee Willie Dooley. Willie Dooley, Josh and Debbie's friend at the carousel. Once I'd had to tell Josh that his puppy was dead, and he'd asked a lot of questions through his tears that neither I nor any other man could answer. Before broaching the subject of Mr. Dooley's dilemma, I thought I'd better have full details, so I took a cab down to Detective Reynolds' office at Precinct Headquarters. I'd known him casually for years, and he told me what he knew. Well, a call came in last night at a little after 11, Mr. Sharp. From whom? The Jansen Butler. He gave his name as Anton Schindler. The burglar had held him up while he opened a safe in the library and helped himself. To what? Unlisted negotiable bonds. In the amount of? $50,000. $50,000? Now, we contacted Jansen. He's in Bermuda. Do you really think Mr. Dooley did it, Reynolds? No, I don't think he did. And why did you pick him up? Well, I didn't pick him up. A couple of my boys brought him in, and they've built a case against him that I can't ignore. What kind of case? Oh, he used to work in Jansen's house, a kind of janitor, I think. Yes. He knew the layout of the house and the habits of the family. That hardly means he did the robbery. Well, of course it doesn't, but whoever did knew that the side door was always left open. That was the means of entry? Yes. You add all this together and include the fact that Dooley was seen in the neighborhood 15 minutes before the mass burglar went to work, and you've got a fair police case. Yes, I can see that. Has the butler identified Dooley as his assailant? Well, Schindler hasn't been in yet. Then it largely depends on Schindler's testimony whether the little man is indicted or not. I'd say it depends on it entirely. 
I think it would be a little difficult to identify a masked burglar. Frankly, so would I. About Dooley. Yes? Is he alone in the world? No, no. There's a wife, uh, Mrs. Irma Dooley. She's practically frantic about this business, Sharp. She's coming in in a few minutes to talk to me. I see. Look, uh, Reynolds. Yes? Don't jump to any conclusions you don't have to. Um, uh, Am I right in thinking you've got an interest in Mr. Dooley? Why, yes. Yes, you're right. Well, I don't see how you tie in with him, Sharp. Well, you see, I've got a, two kids, and they like him. Oh. I guess you'll think I'm not. No, you but... don't have to explain. No? No. I've got kids myself. Oh, excuse me. Randall speaking. Sorry to butt in, but Mrs. Dooley is waiting to see you. Okay, thanks. Well, the wife is here. Then I'll be going. Uh, Sharp. Yes? Don't worry too much about Dooley. I'll do all I can for him. I crossed Irma Dooley's path in the waiting room, and Reynolds gave us a quick introduction, explaining that I was interested in her husband's case. She threw me a bright smile of gratitude. And I remember thinking that she was surprisingly pretty and young to be the wife of Mr. Dooley. Then I started on my homeward way, trying to puzzle out the best method of breaking the news to Debbie and Josh. At least it was nice to know that the little ticket taker had somebody to look after him. The appearance of Irma Dooley made me feel better. But it wouldn't have if I had known what happened in Reynolds' private office after I left precinct headquarters. Everything is working out on schedule, isn't it, darling? Careful with the darling. He's gone. Not getting nervous, are you? The man isn't nervous because he's careful. He may get nervous if he forgets to be. You're not getting nervous. No. How well did you sleep? Fine. Don't lie to me. How well could I sleep? It's no fun framing Dooley this way. The only wrong he's done is to be too much in love with me. Well, the only wrong we've done is to fall too much in love with each other. Still, if only it could be simple and easy. He's the one who's made that impossible. He's the one who's threatened to kill you if you leave him. I know, I know. So, if for no other reason, we've got to go through with this. But, um, when he gets out... No. By that time, we'll be in faraway places where we'll never even think to look for us. When you say that, I don't care what we have to do or who we have to hurt. <laughs> then smile a little. I'll smile all the time, as soon as I'm sure we won't fail. Then you can begin now. We won't. You can't be sure. Oh, yes, I can. They may not convict him. <laughs> don't let that worry you. Walsh. Yeah? What have you done? I've talked to Schindler. The butler? Mm-hmm. He's not an incorruptible man, our Mr. Schindler. What do you mean? I offered him a deal, and he accepted. What can he do? Can't you imagine? No. Then wait till the trial. Wait till the DA questions him, and you'll see. <laughs> Your name is Anton Schindler? Uh, yes, sir. And you're employed by Mr. Jacob Jansen in his home at 211 Bond Avenue? I am, sir. Very good. Now, Mr. Schindler, on the night of April 27th, an armed man entered the Jansen premises and made away with some $50,000 in negotiable bonds. That is quite correct, sir. Also, according to your testimony, the man was masked, which would make it very difficult for you to identify him. <laughs> well, sir... It seemed it would be very difficult at the time. Um, will you explain that remark? <laughs> Gladly, sir. Up to that point, I'd never heard him speak. Who? The <laughs> defendant, sir. And now that you have? It's the sort of voice one does not easily forget, sir. Are you... Are you identifying your assailant, Mr. Schindler? There is no further question in my mind, sir. He's lying! He's the He's defendant, a liar. Mr. Willie Dooley. Somebody, somebody, help me! But no.
nobody could help little Mr. Dooley. The butler's testimony had swung the balance, and the jury was out for less than an hour. When they returned, it was with a verdict of guilty and a three-year sentence at the state penitentiary. And I was left to try to explain the two baffled and broken-hearted children. But, Papa, Papa, it's Saturday again. And we didn't go for two weeks, and Mr. Dooley won't know what happened to us. If we could just go by and say, how do you do? And tell him we're sorry we disappointed him and... But you... you didn't disappoint him, Debbie. We must have. He knows we always come. Listen, Josh, Debbie... What's the matter, Papa? I... I don't know exactly how to tell you this, but... Well, Mr. Dooley isn't there anymore. Dad, where is he? He went away for a while. You mean he doesn't like us anymore? No, that's not what I mean at all. Then how could he go away and leave us? We wouldn't leave him. He didn't want to go away. You see, somebody made him. Who? The police. Police? Yes. What have they got to do with Mr. Dooley? They have something to do with all of us, Josh. When's he coming back? When the police let him. Then make the police let him come back, Papa. Oh, yes, Papa. Make them let him come back. You can do that, can't you? You can do it, can't you, Papa? I tried to do something for Mr. Dooley. I talked to Mrs. Dooley and the lawyer who defended him. But there are things that even the biggest of big guys just can't do. And six months went by. And in our flat, there were six months of mourning for Mr. Dooley. Then, one night in midwinter, I was in a taxi, homeward bound, when suddenly, from the radio... The state and city police ask your cooperation in a manhunt that has been in progress since 6.15 this evening at which time a convict effected his escape from the state penitentiary and is now somewhere at large in this vicinity. He is five foot two, weighs 110 pounds, has blue eyes, thinning dark hair, and answers to the name of Willie Dooley. It was a relief when I got home to find the radio silent and the two admirers of Willie Dooley quietly absorbed in a game of Parcheesi. All was quiet under our roof. The announcement had not been heard. But it had been heard under another roof, and there all was not so quiet. A woman was pacing the floor of a tower apartment in the Greystone Arms. Her name was Irma Dooley, and she stopped in her tracks when... Irma. Reynolds? Yes. Well, well, I haven't seen you in quite a while, lover. It takes an emergency to bring you here. Let's not waste precious time, Irma. Just one thing. Tell me, will you, mister? Tell me what happened to that big love of ours, that romantic flight to faraway places. Could we skip the argument, please? You lose interest in a girl awful fast, don't you, Detective Reynolds? I've come to help you if you'll give me the chance. Yeah? Yes. Here's cash. I thought you'd need it. Five hundred bucks. Oh. All for me. All for you. And it closes our accounts. What's that supposed to mean? Don't nag me, Irma. This is a big, bad night. Buy yourself a ticket on an airplane and go as far as the money will carry you. And what about you? You can count me out. Of what? Everything. Including my life? I said everything, Irma. Just a minute. You can leave me, Reynolds. But you're not going far, darling. No? No, because the minute you walk out, I'm going to phone Sharp and tell him about that frame you worked with Schindler. He'll help me. He was pretty interested in Dooley's case. I hope you're joking. Joking? You think I'd take this fall alone? Go flying off by myself until I wind up stranded and Dooley comes back and kills me? You'd really call Sharp? No, help me. You do, and you know what? What? I'll kill you, darling. I'd given the kids their supper 
told them a long story with a happy ending and put Josh to bed. I was sitting over the Pachisi board for a good night game with Debbie when... Hello? Sure. Yes? Hermidoli. Oh, yes. Who is it, Papa? Just a lady I know. Who are you talking to? My kid. Oh. Go on. I'd like to talk to you. I'm listening. Face to face, I'd rather. When? As quick as possible. Tonight? Yeah, I think you'll think it's worth it. I've got news about how Willie Dooley was framed. Framed? Yeah, just a minute, will you? There's somebody at the door. What was that about a frame? I'm telling you on the level. Just come over and you'll... Where do I come? To the Greystone Arms. What apartment? 11th and listen. Hold on a second, will you show up? I've got to see who that is. Who is it? What's the matter with you trying to break the door? No. No, you can't. It's a gag, isn't it? You didn't mean it when you said you'd kill me. You didn't really mean it. Now, did, did you? <laughs> All the way over in the cab and going up in the elevator, I knew what was waiting in 11D of the Greystone Arms. Still, it was a shock when I walked in and saw her lying there, sprawled out on the floor, her negligee and the carpet around her dyed scarlet with her fresh life's blood. I took a look around the apartment for some clue to tie in with our phone conversation of a few minutes before. But all I could find of any interest was a wad of tens and twenties clutched tightly in the corpse's hand. I pried it loose. I had rippled through it and discovered that it amounted to exactly five hundred dollars when, from the open door behind me, I heard... Pam! 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 It's me. Why, Mr. Dooley. Huh? Oh... Oh, I know you. You're the guy what used to bring a couple of kids to the carousel every Saturday. That's right. Josh and Debbie. What you doing here, mister? Well, I'm a detective. The police? No, private. And Irma called me and asked me to come over. It wasn't more than 15 minutes ago. I see. What is she now? She's... She's lying almost at your feet. Irma... Try and take it easy, Dooley. Oh, oh, my pretty, my pretty. They took her away from me. They took her away. Get hold of yourself. Earn, earn, earn. Listen, listen, she was all for you. That much I can tell you. She was killed trying to tell me that you'd been framed. Yeah? Yes. Now the cops are looking for you. I know how you feel, but you can't afford it right now. If they catch you, you're going back for a longer stretch than before, and Irma wouldn't have wanted that. Now look at me and think. What did she mean? You'd been framed. I don't know who planned it, mister. I don't know who framed me, but I know who lied. Who? That Schindler, that, that butler. He said he recognized my voice. And he couldn't have? How could he have? I wasn't there. Then we're going for a taxi ride. Yes. Yeah. To, to where? To the Jansen House on Bond Avenue. Yeah? Yes. We'll have a little talk with Mr. Schindler and make him tell us exactly what went on. Let's go. Uh, mister? Yes? You, you've been pretty nice to me, and I, I don't know how I'll ever pay you. You don't have to ever pay me. No? No. Just give Josh and Debbie a couple of rides for free. <laughs> Schindler answered the door at the Bond Avenue mansion. He was sorry, but Mr. Jan Jansen was in Nassau this time, and he couldn't admit us. Then the light from a passing car fell on Dooley standing behind me, and Schindler stepped back, the blood draining from his face. He was terrified that Dooley meant to kill him on the spot, and I did nothing to alter that impression. In fact, 
I aided and abetted it every way I could. <laughs> don't let him, don't let him hurt me. I'm not here to protect you, chum. I'm on Dooley's side. And for my part, he's within his rights if he sends you to the morgue. Please, I've got a wife. So did I... Mr. Dooley have a wife. That didn't stop you. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't stop to think. I didn't realize. They, they paid you money? <laughs> yes, sir. He paid me and promised there wouldn't be the slightest danger. And you fell for that? Well, after all, sir, I thought he should know. He was a policeman himself. A and... policeman himself? Yes, sir. Who did it? Who was it? <coughs> Who bribed you to testify against Mr. Dooley? Answer me. Answer me. It was Detective Reynolds, sir. Detective Walsh Reynolds. <laughs> If he had said Methuselah or a man from Mars, I couldn't have been more surprised. Then I went into action. To Dooley, I gave my gun and told him to lie low in the mansion and keep Schindler prisoner. Then I went out and found a phone booth. The desk sergeant on night duty told me I could probably find Reynolds in his rooms at 64 Dawson Street. And, as a matter of fact, I did. The door was open, and I walked in. He was sitting at a desk in the glare of a reading lamp. I want to talk a few things over with you, Reynolds. You remember the morning after Willie Dooley was arrested? Don't sit there looking at me like that. Answer my question. Reynolds. <laughs> I'd pushed him, and he'd gone over, toppling like a rag doll. And for the first time, I saw the shaft of a knife protruding from between the pleats of his shirt front. He was dead, Detective Reynolds was, and dead by murder. I phoned headquarters then and took a look around. A look netted me two observations. One, the room was topsy-turvy, and I had the feeling that somebody had given it a going over in the last few hours. Two... In the desk drawer, I found a stack of canceled checks in the amount of $49,500. Then I added it to the five hundred I'd found in Irma Dooley's hand, got a quick total of 50000 and a light broke over me. Grabbing a cigar box off the desktop, I took a cab for the Jansen place. Dooley was just as I'd left him, holding a gun on the pale and shaken butler, Anton Schindler. You, you found Reynolds, sir. What kind of a question is that, Schindler? Oh, he's a shrewd one, sir. You know I found him, and you know how I found him. Huh? What do you mean, sir? Okay, I'll make a formal announcement. Detective Reynolds is dead. Dead? Of what? Of a knife in his chest. Oh. You can save the act, Jeeves. I know the whole truth now. It was you who murdered Irma Dooley earlier in the evening. You must be mad. Not very. For once it turns out to be the truth. The butler did it. Why? Why on earth should I have killed Mrs. Dooley? Why? Because she knew about the frame and you were afraid she'd reveal all to her husband here. No, no. Believe me, you're wrong. And you made your way to Reynolds' room and did him in. in. Mr. Sharp, sir, please. If you want a reason for that, you can have it, too. You knew where the $50,000 was that was stolen from Jansen's safe. It was in Reynolds' possession and you needed money to leave town on. But no, sir. But it... yes, sir. You searched his rooms for it like a wild man. The place is a shambles. But you failed to find the prize, Schindler. You should have taken your time, like I did. Mr. Sharp. Yes, Dooley. You, you, you mean you found it? Yes. Here it is, in this cigar box. Must have been a good hiding place, because everybody overlooked it. Is, is it all there? Fifty thousand dollars in negotiable bonds. Mr. Sharp, sir? Yes, Dooley. I'll take that cigar box now. How's that, Dooley? You've got the cigar box, and I've got your gun. So give me that money of mine, or I'll put a bullet in you with your gun. Money of yours? I think you heard what I said. How's it yours? By right of theft, Dooley? I don't go for big words, but I kill easy. Yes, so I've noticed. You killed Irma easy. But then you don't think that I... I know you didn't kill her, Schindler. It turns out that Mr. Dooley here was the burglar after all. He entrusted the bonds to his wife to hold for him, but she wasn't to be trusted. 
and she double-crossed him with the aid of a swine named Reynolds. I said I'd take that cigar box, mister. He came out of prison tonight, and because he'd gotten wind of her affair with the cop, he killed her. Then he went to the cop's house, killed him, and looked for the bonds, but he found nothing. Nothing but trouble. Not too much. Give me that box. Here, take it. You're welcome to it, Dooley. It's all yours. And it's all I want. A lot of money, and you get through life. No money, and you wind up in the carousel. Listen to the jabber of a bunch of kids and going out of your mind. What about kids? For eight months, I was stuck in that job with brats in my hair and brats underfoot. How are you, Mr. Dooley? Mr. Dooley, how do you do? I thought you liked kids. That I believed at least. Oh, you did, did you? Well, I hate them. Every one of them. Every single soul of them. Breath and body. That's why I stole this. To get away from that job. To get far away. Mr. Dooley. Yes? You won't get far on what's in that cigar box. Why not? Open it. Open it? Go ahead. You liar. You dirty liar. It's empty. It's empty. That was a trick. Call it a strategy. I knew you'd come out in the open if you thought I had the 50 grand. Where is it? Where's all that my money? Spent, Mr. Dooley. Spent long ago. I I don't like your laugh, Mr. Sharp. And you ain't safe. You think you might be. I'm a little sore now. And I've I got a gun to you. Look out, Mr. Sharp. Stand still. Everybody's had their laugh with little Mr. Dooley. Little Mr. Dooley. And then little Mr. Dooley aims a gun and pulls the trigger. And little Mr. Dooley's bigger than all of them. <laughs> You can hand it over now, Dooley. I wouldn't give an escaping convict a loaded gun, and I figured an empty one would serve to keep Mr. Schindler in his place. Come on now. The game's over. Let's go. I took him down to headquarters and had him booked for murder. Then I went home across the sleeping town. I thought about Debbie and Josh and how, when they were older, I'd tell them why Mr. Dooley never came back and all about the little man. All except one thing. I'd never tell them that he didn't love them. No, not that. Not ever. The National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Big Guy, played by Henry Calvin. Joshua Sharp Detective works for his clients on a strictly cash basis to provide for the needs of his nearest and dearest, Josh Jr. and Debbie. To them, he is the friendly magician, the fabulous hero, the giant among giants, the big guy. The National Broadcasting Company has presented the first in the new series of adventures, The Big Guy, played by Henry Calvin, featuring David Anderson as Josh Jr. and Denise Alexander as Debbie. The script was written by Peter Barry and directed by Thomas Madigan. The music was by George Wright. Others in the cast were Joan Alexander, Roy Fant, and Everett Sloan. Your announcer, Fred Collins. Tonight, hear Phil Harris, Sam Spade, and Petticoat Fever on NBC. Welcome back. Um, You know, the whole opening with his uh, description... 
you know, I, it was cute, but I kind of, you know, it's radio, and so we can't actually see him, and that's all we're left to uh, imagine him by. And I'm just trying to properly adjust my imagination. Uh, I did like at the end that it, he was not as uh, naive as the uh, program early on made him out to be. And, and what I thought was the interesting twist of this was kind of his effort as he's going through this case to preserve his uh, children's innocence and sense of uh, childhood. Uh, you know, some pretty interesting motivation and uh, a couple nice twists here. So not bad, not bad at all. Uh, we'll look forward to the next couple of weeks. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have this from Old Man Murphy on iTunes. Uh, and Adam Graham podcast is a 30-minute grin. Uh, Mr. Graham chooses the program series with care and keeps his commentary upbeat, friendly, and informative. Uh, can't beat it. And then I received this on Facebook from Eunice, who says, uh, says, Hi, brand new listener, love the show. I do data entry, and they just make the time fly by. Depending on the day, I can listen to 10 to 15 episodes, so I'm looking forward to making my way through the backlist. Uh, thanks for doing your part to keep this art form alive uh, from Eunice. Well, thanks so much, Eunice. And, uh, uh, yeah, that is one of the advantages of having uh, 951 previous shows plus specials plus uh, Dragnet plus uh, Superman, if you're interested in that. So whenever you get to this episode, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow. Uh, we're going to find out more in the Broderick Manor. Uh, so join us for the Broderick uh, Manor, uh, Part 3 and Part 4. And then join us back here on Tuesday for another episode of The Big Guy. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Oh, and uh, be sure and give us a call at 208 991 We'd love to uh, hear your voicemail. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, uh, signing off. <laughs>